G'day everybody and welcome to our third episode of Footyology. Who'd have thought we'd last this long? Next thing you know we'll be having a flashback show. I'm Rowan Connolly, with me is my co-host Mark Fine, and as usual we'll be pouring over the ramifications from the latest round of AFL football with all the intensity of a Shane Mumford shirt front. We're going to check out not the news you already know, but the news you will be talking about with our own super sleuth, John Pirrick. Take all your questions via Twitter on keyboard Q&A, take a drive with a former great on Stars in Cars, and rant away till you can't take any more. Let's get started. As I say, good afternoon to a man who'll be very happy indeed after St Kilda's great win over Collingwood on Saturday. G'day, Finey. How are you, mate? What a day it was. 50th celebration of the... 1966 Premiership, no gold lame jacket, no Collingwood. <laughs> That's how football needs to be played in the G. They were great. Prospects are good for them, aren't they? Look, they're a good bunch of kids. They track the ball. They work hard. A simple lesson. If you go to the MCG and you're not willing to follow your man around the ground, you let the team switch play like Collingwood did. St Kilda could beat them there. VFL sides have beat them there. Collingwood, St Kilda were good, but Collingwood were terrible. Well, we'll get into that later. Okay, some great football played over the weekend. A couple of thrillers, plenty of drama, plenty of heroes and villains. Let's look at the highs and lows of round three with Hot or Not. Well, I'm going to go first this week, Finey. I was at um, Etihad Stadium on Saturday afternoon to see Richmond play Adelaide and the Crows absolutely fantastic. They are one of the sharpest teams in the competition. Their skills are pinpoint. They've got an explosive forward line. So we see some action here. It was just like this all afternoon. End to end, great wink up running, long bombs outside 50. I reckon they must have kicked half a dozen of those goals. Rory Sloan with another one there. And they just hit their targets all day long. I reckon the premium's gone up on skill this year in the competition with the rule changes and the extra fatigue. And I think the sides with uh, the best skills are probably the sides that have the best chance of winning the flag. Right now, I think the Crows are one of them. Okay, I'm going to say something that's sort of ridiculous. Hawthorne got better when Buddy left. Others filled the breach and it just worked out okay for them, especially with the compensation. Now, Dangerfield's not replaceable. He's a beautiful player, but Sloan, he might have been meandering a little bit last season. He's obviously picked up. And the two Crouchers, only one of them played on the weekend. Yeah. They now have a midfield that they know that they can go in and be the best player in. Yep. Could be blessing in disguise stuff a la Hawthorne. No, I, I agree. And uh, don't forget Matt, um, Matt Crouch and Scott Thompson. I mean, he's uh, old man River, Scott Thompson. He just does it week after week after week, all without any fuss. No, they are the real deal, the Crows, and look out the rest of the competition. And Tom Lynch didn't play? For the controversial, I'm having a baby Well, clause. no, if it's controversial in the 21st century, yes, really. Yes, it is. Is it? Oh, well, you're old school, aren't you? I remember when uh, Daniel Bradshaw did that before a final for Brisbane, and Lee Matthews never forgave him, but I'd hope we'd moved on a bit. So obviously, you're very unreconstructed. OK, it's your turn. Unreconstructed. I'll tell you what has been reconstructed, and that is ruck battles in AFL football. We don't have a lot of one-on-one -on -one battles. We're not going to have Vandahar and Knights anymore, but now we've got Gorn and Goldstein. It was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I mean, this was, these were two guys. Goldstein got out of the boxes. He kicked three in the first, could have had four, and Gorn ground him down. It was, it was the gruff-looking, bearded Gorn versus everybody's favourite interview, Toddy Goldstein. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, in a close game of football, had either of them not played brilliant games, the other player would have been heralded as the match winner. Mano a mano. We're going to have more of it. Mumford versus either of them is going to be brilliant as well. It's great to see because, I mean, there has been a, a theory that the value of ruck work has been diminished. And, uh, you know, I think guys like this, and particularly doing it basically solo too, I think it really enshrines the, the value of the ruckman in the modern game. Okay, my turn. And this is a knot and it's to West Coast and it's about their kicking a goal. Now, it's a bit of a, an age-old conundrum, this, but uh, you don't convert your chances, you lose the games that count. Now, I had a look at some stats. Interestingly, for all their success last year, they were only 11th in the competition for accuracy. They were the lowest ranked side of any of the finalists. And it came home to roost. In the preliminary final last year, they kicked 10-20, which could have been costly. In the grand final, which they did lose, they kicked 8-13. And of course, Saturday night against the Dockers, 12-20. And they were missing them from everywhere. They, were, they weren't just difficult shots. Even Mark Lacroix is normally a bit of a dead-eye dick. He was missing them from straight in front. So. 
it's a bit of a, a simple one, but um, got to fix up their kicking, otherwise they'll they'll shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, look, I doubt that it's intrinsic because Lacroix's a good kick, Kennedy's a good kick, Darling's okay. Pressure or a midfield probably that doesn't have a lot of good kicks in it. I know Maston's out, but he's a ball slaughterer and Prittis is a great player, but he's not a super kick. So maybe their midfield are kicking too many behinds. Yeah, look, it was tough conditions too, so maybe there are some excuses. But I just reckon you look at those figures, they're three of, what, the last six games they've played. There's certainly something they need to pay attention to. Uh, good call. I, I, I would have had no idea. That's caught me unawares. And not we, often that happens. And we got caught unawares with my next... Hot or not, and it's us, we're not. What? What do we do? Okay, we did something bad. Look, we pride ourselves. It's footyology, and we're footyologists, and which would be accurate. Last week, remember, we showed Will Hoskin Elliott's great mark? Yes, fantastic mark. And you commented that was taken in exactly the same spot as? Oh, I know. I know what I did. I said Byron Pickett, didn't I? Okay. And it wasn't Byron Pickett, Finey. And I didn't, pull you, I didn't pull you up on it. I think Who? we might have some footage of it. It was a famous game played between North Melbourne and Port Adelaide. It started in the morning at 11.40 oh, a.m. Wayne Carey kicked it to the top of the square and Winnie Abraham, if you don't mind, umpire. Sorry, Winston. Apologies. But we're footyologists and we've got to be better than that because we'd be down the throats of anybody else in the, in, in the broadcast game that got it wrong. So come on. No, good call. Good call. Uh, I'm suitably chastened. And uh, my last one is a knot, a uh, bit of a tragic knot. And look, everyone's talking about it. But Bob Murphy, um, how bad was that? Last seconds of the game, Bulldogs up in front, does his knee. And not only does it cost them the game effectively, because James Sicily marked unattended, but uh, it's cost him his season. And according to some experts, Jonathan Brown, one of them, the Bulldogs any chance of winning the flag. Now, I think it's taken it a bit far, but look, purely on a a purist level, and he's much loved, Bob, isn't he? That's become obvious in the last 24 hours. In fact, I'd say he's probably more popular than the Beatles, isn't he? He's uh, a lot of love for him. Esoteric individual, good writer, considered to be the thinking man's footballer. Yeah. But the worst thing out of this is it's sad because he's really sad about it. He was did a presser yesterday, and he couldn't talk. He said, I just don't want to talk. Not a presser, a sort of doorstop. He doesn't want to talk about it. He's really feeling it at the moment, obviously, it's when your time in, at the end of your career can be marked in next weeks, it's going to be hard for Bob Murphy over the next few weeks. But he'll play again. He's got five more to the 300. Yeah, all the best from footyology, Bob. And finishes off finally quickly. OK. Concussion is an important matter. It's, it's been taken very seriously by the AFL. We've got a situation that happened in the Port Adelaide versus Essendon game on Friday night that... Um, I think it's a great concern. That's Darcy Byrne Jones and Sam Gray. Yep. Now, Sam Gray's motionless. Have a look at this. That is a serious head clash. Neither of these players went off. They both self policed. Darcy Byrne Jones, a few seconds later, not long afterwards, it's at the third quarter, kicked a goal, had to come off with the blood rule, and Sam Gray played the quarter out on the field. Now, very different to how St Kilda handled it with McCartan and Rewalt, but I think it's a serious matter. We, we clearly have different levels of care, maybe at clubs. Was it too close to three-quarter time? I don't know, but I think the AFL needs to have a look at it. Yeah, good call, good call. Time for a short break. When we return, all the news you need to know and some you didn't realise you did. But before that, we sent our man Grant Dickinson along to the post-game press conferences this week to ask all the questions the other journos are too afraid to tackle. You brought the bingo card in. It looks like Gibbsy's uh, beaten you again. Yeah, he just uh, continues to get better, doesn't he? Welcome back to Footyology and to a man who makes Woodward and Bernstein look like a couple of junior hacks. He knows what's going on before it's even happened and he's got people making news just so he can report it. It's the ages John Pirrick with tomorrow's news today. G'day JP, what's up? G'day guys. Finally, you just touched on concussion before. Um, obviously at the weekend we saw Nick Revolt go down after a heavy hit with the forearm of Levi Greenwood, the magpie, on Saturday at the MCG. Nick was able to get up and kick the goal. Um, he then went off, he was put through a concussion test. He passed that test, interestingly, but the Saints said, no, you can't go back on the field. They used the new Hawkeye vision, which gives about 15 to 16 different images to show how the incident happened and whether he should be able to go back out on the field. The Saints took the cautious approach. 
I've been told by Dr. Since that's probably the best way to go forward for a lot of clubs now. If it's line ball, you're worried about what's going to happen if he gets hit again. There's implications down the track and also financial implications that we've often read about in terms of concussion. Finally, were you happy with the way the Saints handled this? Yeah, because we won. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, yeah. this is a guy that passed the concussion test, was near best on ground. He was at the time, Given yeah. the McCartan was also off with concussion. Yeah. And Dylan Robertson soon to follow with a knee in the third quarter. All smiles afterwards. And I just wonder, it, you, it's got to be consistent. If that's how St Kilda's going to handle it, mm. even if it was on grand final day, it has to be done the same way. I think the message out of it, um, we interviewed Alan Richardson on SEN on Sunday, and uh, he was quite comfortable with what happened. And because we won. Well, no, I, uh, I think, no, there, I, I felt like there was a concession from him that, um, you know, in this day and age, we, we've just got to be careful. There's so many reports from other sports and from ours, anecdotally in recent times, mm. about long-term effects of too many concussions. I think I think discretion should be the better part of that. So, so how does this marry with Byrne Jones and Sam Gray? Well, it doesn't, and I, I think you, you quite rightly pointed out um, what is an obvious... Um, floor, I think, uh, in the policing of it. Does Mark Evans or the AFL have to step in here? And We know that the AFL... They will now, Fanny, because they're very keen watchers of footyology. I've established that already. Regardless of whether we brought it up or not, do we need some AFL-level policing? Because they've handed it back to the clubs, knowing that the medical staff at the clubs, uh, they've, they've got their Hippocratic Oath, and they really do their job very seriously. But it can be lost in translation here. Do we need say, a steward at every ground to guarantee the consistent admi administration of the concussion rule. Yeah, possibly. Around the grounds, obviously the Magpies are under the pump at the moment. The rooms after the games, there was a bit of talk about Nathan Brown's form. He's off contract this year. Close observers were wondering, has he just slowed down a bit? He was on McCartan and he was on Revolt at the weekend and he could face an anxious year ahead. Interestingly, his brother Mitch has also had a contract. A few years ago, he looked like joining the Saints, but that deal was scuppered by the Eagles at the time. So it's a nervous wait for both boys, I'd say. We touched on Alex Fasolo a fortnight ago. He looks like now getting a two-year contract extension. Um, and Alan Tuvey played well in the VFL at the weekend. His management's told Footyology discussions about his new contract probably won't open until mid-year so he can play regular football. He could be the man the Pies need down back. He's sort of more a Dow defender. He's been working on becoming a more attacking option. Nathan Brown's an interesting one. I, I sort of wax and wane a bit on him. I mean, you know, when they won their premiership, which after all is nearly six years yep. ago now, yep. he was terrific, wasn't he? But he, he sort of, I don't know if it's, you know, strength or, or now, he, he does tend to struggle against the, the real quality key forwards, doesn't he? Interesting, they've got Lockie Keefe coming back next year. Yeah. And I would have thought Nathan Brown could be trade bait if somebody wants a key defender that has currency, but not a lot of tricks. Well, Ben Reid, you know, has just come back from a long succession of injuries, so there's a, he's a bit iffy at the moment as well, isn't he? So you look in terms of long-term structure, defence is clearly where the biggest issues are. Isn't for it yeah. funny that they're both Brown and Reid have both got brothers that are also sort of not really fulfilling their best potential? Something Sam Reid and you think? Mitch Brown. It's, it's, mm. they're, they're a group of talented talls that aren't getting the best out of their football. Maybe they should swap uh, with the respective clubs they're at. Maybe they should play together. <laughs> Possibly. That, does, that looks unlikely at this stage of their careers. Just around the grounds, Dion Prestia, the gun Gold Coast midfielder, he's put off contract negotiations until mid-year. He keeps being linked with Richmond. Speaking of the Tigers, Brett Deledio has ruled himself out of the West Coast game this weekend. He hopes to step up his training this week from a high quad strain and needs to get back to practising on his um, set shooting for goal, which has been an issue in terms of his health and, and the pain he's been feeling. And also, I wouldn't be surprised if Carlton moves soon on Jacob Wietering to extend his contract. He's obviously had a great start to the year and was the rising star this week. Might be the Brownlow medalist, according to some people. Give him another three weeks, I say. <laughs> the first three have been fantastic. And finally, move over the Panama Papers. There's been a big investigation about what's been going on around the league, and it sort of was broken this morning in the Herald Sun. Um, recently, there's been some concerns about someone who's been apparently pinching some bottles of Gatorade post-match. It was a um, major investigation. And Rowan, any idea who this could be? No comment. <laughs> Why have you been doing this, Rowan? Well, I was thirsty. We're covering AFL footy. Uh, you know, we're entitled to grab a drink. Look, I got sick of the corporatisation of the press conference. Logos everywhere. You know I'm a good socialist, Finey. I decided to restore some integrity to the whole press conference concept. You're left of socialist. 
don't steal people's gator roads. Now, you know what will happen now. They know I'm partial to the lemon and lime, so they're going to start putting in that blue crap that no one touches. I, don't, I still don't know what flavour blue is, do you? Blue, what is it? Blue. Mountain ice? Growing up, it was dishwashing detergent or... <laughs> <laughs> was, I don't know. It was not to be drunk. But it's so. no good. I mean, it's, it's no surprise Blueberry Big M went the way it did all those years ago. Maybe you deserve a two-week suspension. What do you think, Fanny? Mate, if I don't turn up to the press conferences, who else will? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to another break. When we come back, the segment that's not only got the football world talking, but rocking out in their cars like a bunch of bogans. John, you brought two Oz kickers on after half time. One brought his own tea, one got reported for headbutting. How important were they? Yeah, it's it's critical. I mean, I don't know what that, our age was compared to Carlton's today. I assume it would be a bit younger. Teddy probably bumped it up a little bit. Welcome back to the show and to the fun part of the week. It's finding behind the wheel, me crapping myself in the back, and this week in the passenger seat, none other than an old bomber and a dual club AFL coach. It's stars in cars. Well, we're back for another stars in cars at one of the most famous suburban football grounds back in the day when there were 12 of them. None other than Windy Hill, and the star is a bomber that played at the club, he was an assistant coach and he coached two senior AFL clubs, none other than Robert Shaw. Good morning, Robert. Finey, welcome to my territory. I know you don't get out here much, but uh, fantastic. G'day, Ro. How are you, Shaw? This is familiar. Oh, it's great territory, isn't it? The bomber heartland. Uh, we've both seen a lot of time in, in this place, the stands, the grounds, the old change rooms. Uh, do you miss that old suburban environment in the AFL? Well. Yes and no, look, it's all moved on, but it was great to go to Princess Park the other week for the Essendon Carlton NAB Cup. That was a beauty. It was a throwback, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a throwback. We had to park about a kilometre away. It used to be a milk bar, Mr and Mrs Clancy's milk bar. It's now a uh, chiropractic. And every time after training, uh, 40 blokes would pour into this little <laughs> single fronted milk bar and have milkshakes. Milkshakes, that's and, right. And milkshakes, that, and this was recovery, milkshakes and cigarettes. Yeah. Right, so the, the flavour of the month was Blue Heaven, Mr and Mrs Clancy's Blue Heaven milkshake. It was unbelievable. So I left home when I was 17. Um, Des Tuttenham and Jimmy Matthews came to my school, Elizabeth Matric College in Hobart, and there was an announcement. I was in class, Mark. Yes. And the announcement came over um, the loudspeaker. Would was Mr. Mr. Sh uh, Robert Shaw please report to the headmaster's office. And you thought, what have I done this time? Well, it was a regular occurrence, so <laughs> it didn't surprise me. Just do a U back here, Mark, and we'll go We'll go into downtown Essendon for you. Anyway, so I've walked. No pack drill, no announcement, Mr Shaw, Robert Shaw, sorry, to, um, to the headmaster's office. So, who have I belted now? Or well, I've pinched someone's footy in the playground or something like that. I walked in, the headmaster said, come in, sit down, and in worked two gentlemen. And I recognised one of them, I didn't recognise the other. I said, that's the Collingwood captain. And it was Des Tuttenham. Well, it wasn't the Collingwood captain, it was the Essendon assist, uh, captain coach, Des Tuttenham. And I was basically, I don't know, I was in a matric year. You did two years of matric, finally. Yep. You did uh, year 11 and 12, and then you tried to get your matriculation. So this was year 11, so that was the end of me. Um, didn't pass the subject, lost my concentration, and um, <laughs> and uh, ten months later, I was uh, I went to a cricket carnival, under nineteen cricket carnival for Tassie, and didn't come back. Left mum, dad, my sisters at home, and um, came to this magnificent establishment where I spent I spent the uh, majority of my life, both summer and winter. You, yep. you were like dogged by serious injuries for much of the time you played, weren't it? Yeah, but that's the way it goes. It didn't, well, it worried me because at 27 I gave it away, but I, was I, I wasn't dedicated to one particular craft run because I love my footy and I love cricket. So I'd play footy and then go straight into cricket without yeah. any cricket pre-season. Yeah. And I'd do the same with cricket. I'd play right through to the end of the season and go into a footy season without any pre-season. Yeah. But I spent 12 years of my life there, 12, 
you know, or a lot, lot longer than that, you know, 12 months a year with a month off, um, playing footy and cricket because that was my passion and to play here at this club was just, uh, and with the personalities both in footy and cricket was fantastic. So I was never a dedicated fitness fanatic. So I got a lot of injuries, but I got a lot of freak injuries. I had what, nine operations in Jeez. the 11 years that I was there. Did your Achilles, didn't you? Yeah, I snapped both Achilles, dislocated my shoulder, did my knee, <laughs> um, reconstructed my thumb. Wow. Um, what was the most painful of, of all the injuries? Uh, the shoulder dislocations, uh, uh, the worst one, the worst recovery as far as pain. Uh, it hurt at the time, it was over at Collingwood. And um, Renee Kink. Oh yeah. Renee had the, it's, it just about sums me up I think. You know, a, a, a young bloke jumped on, fell on my Achilles at training, just snapped in half, freak accident. So I'm playing on Craig Davis at Collingwood and Renee ran past. So I've thrown an arm out to try and tackle him. What an absolute waste of time. Yeah, there's a bit but, of weight behind the incredible but, Hulk. Yeah, he's going at full pace. I've stuck the arm up and fair dinkum finding, it's gone, it slid <laughs> on his oil, up the back of his jumper. He's kept going and so's my shoulder. Oh. So I'm there like this with a dislocated shoulder and that oh, was, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> I come over as a half forward and uh, couldn't get a position. They put me to half back, then I grew a bit and went to full back. You grew a moustache, I know that. Everyone grew a moustache. Yeah, very so how, good, how good was Robert in the footy cards? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so well, that's a claim to fame. I've got four Scanlon footy well, cards. There you go. You know, which you my daughters get great delight out of. Um, they get great delight out of finding them on eBay and buy, buying them for about $1.75. You don't oh. get a Scanlon's footy card if you're a mark, do you? I just want to touch on a couple of things because, I mean, this is all about this. And, and of course, you also coached Fitzroy in Adelaide. and. You've got a couple of great stories there. You've got to tell the viewers the story of how tough it was to recruit at Fitzroy and the day you hit your own kick. Oh, look, how long have I got? <laughs> you, you can edit it out. Look, um, about five minutes. We went to a draft and uh, we had no money. Uh, the CEO at the time, oh, we had that many CEOs, and he said, uh, this is in the 90s, mate. This is not in the 30s. And he said, you've got $2,000 to spend <laughs> on a base payment, right? And I said, we can get Mark Zanotti. We can get Mark Zanotti from... Um, West Coast. From, uh, no, he was uh, Brisbane, Brisbane at the oh, time. Yeah, Brisbane. And they said, you can't get him. He wants $12,000. And so me and Neville Stibbard, who was a recruiting bloke, we went to the draft and he said, you must not get Mark Zanotti. We haven't got the money. So... My elbow, my, our, up comes our pick, pick number six, pre-season draft, Fitzroy Football Club. I went bang to Neville Stebbard and he went, oh, he went, player number 275, Mark Zanotti, <laughs> Brisbane Bears. And the CEO leant over the draft table and said, you have done it, you pay for it. <laughs> so we had to come up with the 12 large. So Neville Stebbard, you know Neville, played in the back pocket yeah. for Port Melbourne. Very played, good player. Very good player. Had very good connections down the wharf. Oh, yeah. Mainly with the painters and dockers, the fishmongers, and the fruit. So there's a little bit happening down there over the history of, uh, hasn't it? You bet there, so we used you to bet get, there was. Yeah, we used to get Rusey and, um, you can turn right at Buckley Street. Yep. Uh, we used to get Rusey, Lynchy, Richard Osmond to sign jumpers. I reckon Rusey signed 100 jumpers. So at five o'clock in the morning, myself, Neville Stibbard, um, the doorman, Tommy Couch, the footy manager, Brucey Pell. We would head down to um, the docks, and never with all his contacts. So we would raffle off these jumpers, right? Yeah. And they'd look after us. They'd give us, they knew who we were, Fitzroy, we'll look after you. So they were giving us a sling, as well as buying raffle tickets. So we raised $12,000 cash. A little bit of walking around in the back pocket. So, at least Mark, it was legitimate. I thought the story was going to be Mark Zanotti that's paid not for by the mob. Well, it's sort of not. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> this is the '90s, so there's a bit happening, Mark. Anyway, so we um, we played uh, North Melbourne out at Baronia, and Mark drove up in his old. He he must have bought a thousand dollar car or something, an old um, station wagon, and we um. 
we slipped the money into <clears throat> into his car in a brown paper bag. <laughs> of a course. brown paper bag. Of course. Twelve thousand dollars worth of two dollar notes, five dollar notes, and ten dollar notes from the raffle. This is it, folks. Over the top. <laughs> You got the air guitar? I'll take it does. Take a long line. Take a long line. Take a long line with him. Robert? You're an old rocker? Hey, Thanks, Thanks boys. Trying. I've just realised you got the Racket Dacca shirt on, mate. I dress. <laughs> what do they call it when you dress for. Um... Success, no? No, dress in costume. Hidden <laughs> costume. I'm not sure you are the non accent. That's another Stars in Glass with the first genuine Tasmanian bogan ever held in captivity on the mainland. Need a cooling solution that will stand up in the toughest conditions? Consider a Rapid Cool radiator from Radiator Direct. With industrial and truck radiator technology, Rapid Cool's reinforced radiators are suited to harsh Australian conditions. Radiator Direct, the better cooling solution. Are players aware they need to watch Footyology 7.30 on Tuesday night? It's really clear. Absolutely clear? Absolutely clear, yeah. Welcome back to Footyology, and as we tell you each week, this show isn't about us, as fascinating as we are. It's about the game and about your input. Send us your questions via Twitter using the Footyology hashtag, and Finny and I will knock your socks off with our pithy responses. It's time for Keyboard Q&A. Well, the punters are loving this segment, Finey. Uh, no shortage of tweets coming through last night. Again today, and even as we speak, they are rolling into the Twitter sphere, which you've just joined. I am there. Okay. Hashtag, oh no, at, it's at. Yeah, he's still getting his head around it. Okay. Twitter me at Finey, not Viney. Finey, not Viney. And I'm, I'm up for it. Very funny. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to give mine to Rowan underscore Connolly. Be careful. The one without the underscore is a fake account. Do not go there, Finey. It's, yeah, I've got, to, I've got to fill you in on the whys and wherefores. All right, let's oh, get into Jesus. our tweets this week. And uh, from AFL Habit, I think it is, he asks, are the Saints in line for the finals next year with Carlisle in the fold? Over yeah. to you, Saints man. I think they'd like to think they would be. Not just Carlisle in the fold. It was a big day on Saturday for St Kilda. Nathan Freeman played his first yes. game, not for the Saints, but for the Sandringham development team. And he had 46 touches in three quarters. That's not correct. I checked up well, on Well, Alan it. Richardson said that. He had 46 touches in one full quarter and two quarters in which he played 10 minutes. Really? And that's a fact. He doesn't say what for the standard of the um, VFL development there was competition. A, there was a lot of one twos and one two threes because he's a, an elite runner and a very good footballer. Okay, yeah, no, I, I think uh, great signs for them. They've just got so many talented young players, you'd expect them to keep improving. Let's go to our next tweet, hopefully loading now, and it comes from Mark, who asks, what's the point of under-9s footy having no scoring when at AFL level all we talk about is great scoring games? And that's a really good point. I mean, we're, high scoring footy is back. Um, I've never really understood that, you know, too competitive ethos for young kids. I don't see any harm with... Kids have got to learn to lose at some stage, don't they? What's the problem with that? And in my family, I'm the one that teaches them. <laughs> yes. I've got a magnificent record in trivial pursuit, table tennis. There needs to be scoring. It's, it's uh, PC, political. But I think we imported it from America, probably from the West Coast. It's political correctness gone mad. OK, let's go to our next tweet. Um, and it is from oh, Dull Pludger who actually lost a bet with me about Essendon uh, winning a game this season, very generously donated to a charity. So good on you, Dole. You'll notice he's got the plugger locket avatar there, Finey. And I think that's um, a picture of a plugger with a tooth missing. Yeah, after after he knocked that guy out with a footy at the SCG. Classy. Knocked out Peter Coven too. Um, Eddie had form is as meaningless as pre-season form. Discuss. Wrong. Yeah, I think that's wrong. I'm pretty sure last time I checked, you get four points for a win at Eddie had. Well, the good teams win anywhere, don't they? And proof of that was uh, the Hawthorne Bulldogs game. I mean, the Bulldogs had won 11 straight leading up to Sunday, but Hawthorne 
had won 13 of their last 15, so that becomes 14 out of 16. West Coast, I think, go all right there. I, I understand sort of the theory to an extent. It dis, does seem to encourage a, a faster, more running game, but, but I think finals footy is a little bit different to regular season footy wherever it's played, isn't yeah, it? I mean, look at the St Kilda situation through 2004, right through to 2011, say. Yes, St Kilda became a very good team at Eddie had an a, almost unbeatable team there before they tackled the MCG in earnest, but you can't say that in 9 and 10 St Kilda couldn't play anywhere but Eddie had. I mean, they almost won grand finals. They won interstate. They won the MCG in, in the lead-up games. It comes last, but Eddie had form is good form. No, I'm with you on this one. Okay, next off the mark we have... It is Jason, I think, who asks, I love a fairy tale. I love Bucks. Can the Pies pull it together, or is it all just a great magpie marketing hype? Wait for my rant. Um, yeah, jury's out. Jury's out on Bucks now, I think. Uh, certainly, as many alarm bells ringing for the coaching panel as the players on Saturday, I don't think you can sheet home full responsibility to one or the other, but they're certainly under the pump now, and, uh, yeah, we've both got a vested interest in this one, which we'll come to. Uh, next tweet, please, Mastro. And we have Andrew, who asks... Oh, good question. Is Ben Stratton the most underrated defender going around? He plays on small opponents like Eddie Betts, medium-sized opponents, Jake Stringer, tallish Jack Darling, beats them all. Very, very good tweet. He is incredibly low profile for a man of his record and uh, the scalp's under his belt. Yeah, he is. I actually watched him on the weekend against Stringer. Stringer really... I was a bit disappointed in Stringer, actually. I thought he was yeah, a bad one. unnecessarily nervous and right to the very end of the game didn't hold his feet. And he was made nervous by Ben Stratton. Not by the scoreboard, not by Hawthorne. It really is Ben Stratton who put him in an uncomfortable zone. That's a good tweet. He's very, very low-key, isn't he? I remember a, a pretty sure tackle of his saved them a preliminary final against Adelaide in uh, 2012. Yeah, no. that now, now, if I get a tweet like that, do I retweet it? Do I reheat it? What, <laughs> what do I do with you it? You retweet it, and you can even put a little quote on top saying, I think this is a very good question and keep them coming. Tweet, tweet. Uh, I'll have to give you some troll education shortly too. That's that's one of the pitfalls of, of this platform. Lucas asks, drop Crowley unless reinstated to tagging duties for Essendon, obviously. Surely best and only value to the team. And good point, they're up against um, oh, Dangerfield this week. Yes, that's right. He's gone to Geelong, hasn't he? Yes, he has. Um, look, I, I think yeah, it's a, he needs to be thrown on the ball. I, I think they've got to sort of bite the board here because he's proving no value as a forward. Look, his lack of preparation has clearly caught him out a bit, but he's a, he's a bit of a one-trick pony, isn't he? It's interesting, because when he came into the game, he um, it, it was basically as a forward. In fact, I'm pretty sure in his first game, he might have kicked four goals. Um, but he's a proverbial run-with player now, and I think, yeah, look, if he can't play in that role, give him a spell and bring in a, a kid for the long term. Oh, he's been terrible. Uh, John Worsfold was asked about him on the weekend, said that he'd had a couple of injury concerns, a niggle just before the season, so was underdone first game. There, He kicks the ball sideways 15 metres, and he's 50-50 to hit a target. He used to actually be quite a long kick. He's a resurrected player. He's helping the club out. If he's not tagging, then I reckon he's dropped. Ripping bloke too, incidentally. You've never come across a guy at so greater odds with his on-field reputation, but I'm sure there's a few in that camp. Next. Will, Will Minson? Uh, in reverse. Yeah, they say Will's brilliant off field. <laughs> well, what do Rocket Aid say about Will Minson, the dumbest smart bike going around? I ran into Will. Sorry, Will. I, I ran into Will at the Adelaide airport. Yeah. Um, I don't think he's a genius. Well, speaking of the <laughs> speaking of the Western Bulldogs, Otis Driftwood, one of my favourite tweeters, asks, I think the dogs have decent depth. John Brown said the dogs' 2016 chances are over without Murphy. What do you reckon? I reckon John O'Brien's probably looking for a bit of a headline there. It's too, yes, the leadership will be missed, but it's a lot they're bereft of other guys who can step up to the captaincy plate. And in terms of the position he plays particularly, um, they've got as good sort of rebounding creative defenders as anyone. Eastern Wood's a gem, and uh, Lucas Adams has really... Marcus Adams? Oh, did I say Lucas? It's Sorry. actually, you know why you said Lucas? Why? Because we had a tweet from Lucas? No, because I reckon the player they bring in is Lucas Webb. He started last year yes. in really good form, 
He's one of these backup players that not a lot of people know a lot about, but he can play. Now, Nathan Rovat's out for six weeks. Not mm. that he takes Murphy's spot, but he would have been close. Watch out for Lucas Webb, and Mark Adams has been a revelation. So can they win it without Murphy? Yeah, but I don't, I don't think they were going to win it with Murphy. No, so I don't either. Well, why am I in this discussion? Because Jonathan Brown started it. Look, he's got a bit of a... He's, last year it was Rewald has to retire. Yeah. He's got a bit of a dollar quote about it. Well, he's not the only former player in the media with a bit of dollar quote about him. Hey, speaking about that, aren't we due... Isn't tomorrow the day that Eddie Maguire will make his monthly insane um, <laughs> contribution to life in Melbourne? <laughs> G'day, Ed. I have no association with that comment whatsoever. Come he's on, we've he's got working get, monthly. We've got to get his... Uh, I don't think Ed's on Twitter either. Uh, AK Chapman, another of my favourite tweeters, he asks, are the teams with poor skills, and he's cited Richmond, Collingwood, Fremantle being really found out this season? I would argue yes. I, I, look, I wrote about this in The Age on Monday. I think the premium on skill has definitely increased this year. It's because the game is opening up, there's more scoring, there's a bit more fatigue... So high premium on sides that can hit targets. That's why I'm so impressed with Adelaide. It's why Hawthorne have ruled the roost for as long as they have. Um, I think sides like Richmond are dragging the chain a bit. I say simplistic chicken and egg stuff, that. Collingwood, Fremantle, Richmond have had terrible starts for the season. Ipso facto, they've got poor skills. Yeah, but if, you, if we went back to the start of a season when all were equal, you wouldn't judge those three teams to be in the... Upper echelon Why not? of skill. Hang on, Richmond last year ended Fremantle's unbeaten run mm. by the absolute precise use of foot to pass for an entire night at Subiaco. They True. That was probably their best performance of the year. Oh, that's but it's interesting, Fanny. I, I spoke. I asked Damien Hardwick this at the press conference, and he said, "You look at the actual stats. This is where they can be deceptive. They're number one, I think, for uh, disposal efficiency. But it's all that sort of chippy, chippy, not under pressure stuff under the heat." And look, I was at that game. The amount of times they went forward and turned it over, they've got to be better than that. I've got a mini rant. I implore football fans to watch football and stop reading statistics and, and building up a case after the game mm. about based on stats. Watch the game. You get a feel for it. But he was agreeing with you. He was saying yeah, I'm that so, stat I'm is deceptive. That, that has to be how you assess football. Collingwood and Richmond, uh, down on confidence, down on mojo, and Fremantle play a sort of brand of football that isn't skill based, it's Is that what Rand directed at David King? Maybe David King does use the stats a lot. He does. He brings a certain a analytical, numerical I think quality to the game. I think there's place for somebody to take up that role. I think he does it well. He's filled the void, but let's just have one king in this case and uh, no princes running around impersonating him. Because okay, more enough. tweets. I think we've got time for a couple more. Okay. No. No, no, they've wrapped up. Anyway, look, uh, keep your tweets coming. It's a big part of our program. And uh, as you saw, we'll answer them. May not answer them correctly, but we'll answer them. Let's get to another break. When we return, it's time to test your team's credibility. Well, Grant Dickerson from Footyology. Um, those things you put on the dashboard of cars, this head wobble up and down, sort of a bit like what you're doing now. Are you upset that the manufacturers haven't made one for you and have yeah. asked yourself why or anything like that at all? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I think dissecting why is really, really important. Welcome back. It's that moment again when we look at the ladder, not the win-loss sort, but at our own version, the best measure yet of expectations versus success. Scientifically validated by a lot of men with test tubes, white coats, and far too much time on their hands. It's time for the credibility ladder. Okay, love this segment. Uh, John Pyrrhic rejoins us. You all set for this, JP? Pumped. I'm going to uh, have a few <laughs> stern words to you after revealing my identity before uh, with regards to the Gatorade. But let's get into this ladder. Uh, some great footy played during the week. Let's start at number one, and we've got to have a good discussion about it. But uh, let's get it up on the screen now and have a quick look. Who deserves to be number one this week, boys? Surely the Saints. It's hard, uh, really, it's hard, all jokes aside, hard to beat, isn't it? Well, as far as credibility goes, if they came into the game as outsiders. They lose two players at half time, another player early in the third quarter. They only use 72 out of 90 rotations. Mm. And if not for tiring, noticeably in the last five minutes, they win by 50 points. They're on top. It ticked all the boxes, didn't it? Like uh, Richo really harped on about the courage. But, uh, you know, I think 
skill. Um, they, they took a risk. The young players led from the front. The older players were good. Sort of everything clicked. And, you know, if that's going to be... Uh, they, they've raised the bar for themselves, I think, on the strengths of that. So we all agree St Kilda number yep. one. OK, we need to talk about two and three because I, I think this is a matter of some contention. Adelaide. I really were, was, as I said before, really impressed with the Crows. I just think they're as sharp as any team going around at the moment. Really good win over Richmond away from home. It was a great win, don't get me wrong. I've yeah. got, I'm, I'm going to throw a real... Um, Smoking? Yeah. A, this is outside the square thinking, but coming into the game, this coming to this round, is there any team that was under more pressure or got a bigger kick in the guts in Melbourne in round two? Now, no, as far, no, no, as far, as, as, far as credibility yeah. is concerned, yeah. we're talking credibility yeah. here. They didn't win the game. They are trailing seven straight to nothing 12 minutes into the game. I mean, everything is set up for the old Melbourne to be the laughing stock of the competition and, and heads rolling. So you are proposing that we put a loser from the second. weekend yep. second on the ladder. Well, think about it. It's a brilliant game of football. They go within either... a not a Lindsay Thomas spoil or a little bit more poised by young Billy Stretch winning against a real premiership contender in Tassie where North play very well as far as credibility they won heaps of it on the weekend I, I say I but, but they won so much of it mate seriously think about it they had to show something I think they we'll did, have they? to run this yep. by the highly credible John Pyrrhic what do you think yeah I'll, I'll go the Demons I, I, I really think they played really well alright well this, they, this is how good a concept it is we have a losing side in second place on the credibility ladder and that's why this concept is catching on it <laughs> makes sense because I mean wh what do you think of Melbourne now as compared to seven days ago I think uh, a fair bit more than I did that's what it's all okay. about well explained. Okay. All right, okay, so that you happy with the Crows then in third spot? Yeah. Really good win. A great win, and they continue to rise not only in credibility, but also they drop in odds for the grand final win. Correct. Uh, okay, I, th I think yep. there's another debate to be here, uh, to have here uh, with fourth and fifth, and it concerns Sunday's game. Excellent, excellent game between Hawthorne and the Western Bulldogs. It was a thriller. They both had their moments. Hawks on top early. Bulldogs. I think at one stage kicked about 10 or 12 goals, looked to have it. Hawks came back as we knew they would, the drama of Bob Murphy. But such a ripping game. I feel like uh, Hawthorne won the game, which champion sides do, but the Bulldogs lost nothing in defeat, apart from the four points, obviously, but in credibility terms. Hang on, you're not talking about a Pyrrhic victory. <laughs> Very good. Possibly. Very good. <laughs> okay, so I'll throw that open yep. to you guys. Who would you have? Hawthorne, Bulldogs, uh, who's above the other? I think the Hawks should be in front. Like, you can underestimate how good they are. They were trailing in that last quarter. They look gone. They've kicked, what, seven goals in that last quarter. Sicily's stood up. So I'd, I'd go the Hawks. And, and I, I almost say this as, a, as an ode to how the Bulldogs have come so far in a year and three games, that Hawthorne's win was full of merit because the Doggies are so good. I'd yep. give it to Hawthorne. They beat a very, very good team. Yeah, no, happy with that. So we'll go Hawthorne uh, in fourth spot then on our ladder as we go back to the graphic. And, yeah, Bulldogs for fifth. OK, we're going to sort of fly through this middle rung pretty quickly because a lot of them were self-explanatory. Now, if we're putting Melbourne second, surely North have to be up there too. Great standard game down in Tassie. Yeah, and they, they did get that lead up, so yeah. we're all agreed. Yep. North next yep. in sixth spot. Behind them, Sydney, who had a, a bit of a fight on their hands against GWS, but got there in the end. West Coast, good winners against Freo, should have won sorta, by more. Sort of, sort of. They what, were well, they were well served by the punctured lung to Sandler. They were yeah. shot themselves in the foot with the kicking though, like we yeah. mentioned. So, um, yeah, it was a win they needed to have. Cats, ho hum. Yeah, did the business over Brisbane, business, didn't yeah. they? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Brisbane games sort of have that effect on you, don't they? Sophomoric. The it's a pity. Yeah. Uh, Gold Coast next. Again, bit of a routine job, really, isn't it, against Carlton? Yeah, I think they would have been a bit disappointed. Where's that ladder, folks? We need that ladder back. Uh, after the Suns, we have Port Adelaide, who, again, we had a... Yeah, they're probably the three routine victories of the weekend, aren't they? Port, fantastic early, but... They should have just gone on with it. That, yeah, was, a, that yeah. was a bit of a lazy effort. Yeah, Kenny yeah. Hinckley wasn't happy, was he? No, yeah. no. Yeah. No, it probably damages their credibility. Okay, GWS underneath Port, Essendon, Carlton, Fremantle, Brisbane. Okay, we've got one debate left. We're going to have to have it fairly quickly, but Richmond and Collingwood. Who takes out the round three wooden spoon? Pies. Collingwood. <laughs> yeah, I tend to agree. Richmond were pretty bad, but the Pies stunk it up badly. Yeah. So sorry, Collingwood fans. 
hopefully next week you can restore a bit of that credibility. Thanks for joining us again today, JP. Great work from you, and you're obviously dressed by a, a better uh, clothing firm than Finey or I. We'll, uh, we'll try and sharpen, our, uh, uh, sharpen up our... Have, a look, have, a, have a look at us, the boys in black. We're dressed by gr Greek grandmothers. Well, at least I'm not wearing the same shirt I, I wore last week. Time for our final break now. One taken with breathless anticipation, because when we return, Finey and I are going head-to-head -head in all our righteous indignation. You Snow White movies just come out, but it hasn't got any dwarfs in it because it's politically incorrect. Are you guys going to go and see it as a playing group? Name, name them, fish. The dwarfs? Oh. Happy, sleepy, dopey, doc, grumpy. Welcome back, and we've had an amazing response to this final segment of our show. Delight, despair, outrage bruised egos, and plenty more people asking, just what are you two old farts on about? Well, you're about to find out. It's our angst against the clock, one minute each, to prove we've got a whinge and we're not afraid to use it. Get ready for the footyology rant off. Okay, Finey, my turn to go first. I'm off the long run, new ball in hand. Count me in. Three to read. I took a trip to Etihad Stadium on Saturday to watch Richmond play Adelaide, Finey. At least that was the plan. Little did I know I'd be taking a trip back in time. Seriously, I could have been at Princess Park in the early 1990s watching Hawthorne sink the boots into the Tigers again, or watching Gary Ablett Sr. kick another 14 goals on Brian Lees or Michael Laffey at the MCG back in the 80s. You know that movie Groundhog Day where that TV weatherman gets stuck in a time loop? Well, Richmond are the AFL's version. But at least in the film, Bill Murray gets to go on a bender, seduce half punk Satorni's women and end up with a hot chick like Andy McDowell. What do you get in Groundhog Day Tiger style? You get several dozen turnovers, another loss, the same old talkback calls ringing Finey's final siren and yet more bloody microwave membership cards. Come on, Damien Hardwick, stop telling your players where to stand at kick-ins for five minutes out in the track and get them kicking the footballs to blokes actually wearing yellow and black jumpers. And put some heat on them if they miss, like making them watch an endless loop of Trent Cotchen winning the toss in that final in Adelaide, then kicking into a 10-goal breeze. That should put the fear of God into them. Ask their supporters about that. After all, they're the ones sitting through the same bad comedy every week for the same lack of laughs and the same crappy reviews. Good. I don't know if it was a minute. If I get given a week to live, I hope it's by you, mate. <laughs> yeah, a bit of large Shane with the countdown clock there, but uh, I'll, I'll offer the same to you, right? Tell me when you're ready. Okay, you did Richmond, so have a guess who I'm doing. Uh, I am. University? Yeah. <laughs> Three, two, one, rant. The Collingwood Football Club are not loved by many people who don't barrack for them, and now they are particularly hated by me. You see... There's a problem that I have to live with throughout this entire season, and that is while the rest of the Collingwood-hating fraternity that makes up everybody that doesn't barrack for them is taking immense pleasure, enjoying, in fact, having a cold shardy, and I mean schadenfreude, not chardonnay, with every loss, there's one little black duck, that's me, who is cringing with their terrible performance. You see, they were, prior to the start of the season, considered by some in the media to be a bit of a finals chance, top four chance. In fact, there were a few idiots who thought they could win the grand final. I should know, I am that man. And with every terrible performance comes the obvious barbs aimed at me that I know nothing about football. I'm in this, I'm, I'm stuck in this netherland of hating them but needing them to win for my own insatiable ego. I got sucked in. I got sucked in by a team that read well on paper. I thought that they had the midfield with Adams and Trelaw. They're good, but Crisp has gone stale. Greenwood produces more turnovers than Mrs. Max Bakery on an apple glut weekend. Side bottom, if he stays out of the team much longer, can change his name to bottom side. And as for Dugowie, if he keeps playing the way he is, he's Dugowie, Dugowie, to gone. <laughs> I mean, the back line was only average to start with, but I didn't think it'd get there. The forward line on the weekend was pitiful. I know Jason Cloak, I know Cameron Cloak, I know Travis Cloak, but now there's Invisibility Cloak. I don't know how he got to the club, but Harry Potter, take him back. As for Jeremy Howe, I mean, I sat next to Collingwood supporters. He went from Howe to Jeremy Who to Jeremy Why to Jeremy What to Jeremy When are we getting rid of this? No hoper. For Solo, 
He's for selfish. You know the old saying, less is more. Well, it was with Darcy on the weekend. And as for this kid, Goodyear, Goodyear maybe, bad day definitely. They're no good. They're hopeless. And I have to want them to be good. Why can't I be like you, Rowan, and every other Collingwood hater and be disingenuous when I talk about wanting them to be better in the media? Collingwood, you've got me where you want me. I hate you. Oh, very good. Very good. You've been very self-deprecating today. I tell you what, you can't label me as a Collingwood hater. I was once infamously photographed wearing a Collingwood jumper and uh, Bomber fans have never let me forget it. No, well done. Good job. Now, I d- quick- The one good thing was there was no gold Lamo jacket. And by the way, it's not a, lo- it's, it's not a gold jacket. It's a glow mesh jacket. Something my 86-year-old Jewish mother would wear. Now leave job for alone. Quickly, how do uh, our viewers vote this week for their Oh, that's right. Quickly. Last week, last week we didn't get any votes. No. Too difficult. Yeah, well, so this week I've simplified it. Simplify it. To vote, simply learn to fly an aeroplane. Once you have your pilot's licence, then take off from either Moorabbin or Essendon Airport with a smoke machine or a proper sky riding equipment. And on a clear day with no wind in the sky, write ROCO or FINEY. Once registered by the Meteorological Bureau, those votes will be counted, and next, year, next week we should have hundreds. Absolutely, they'll be pouring it. Oh, by the way, yes. if you are an existing pilot, you are ineligible to vote. No pilots, only trainees and people who want to learn to fly. Come on, be fair. Thank you, Fawny. That's it for this week. Thanks for joining us once again at Footyology. Hope you've enjoyed it. We're on every Tuesday at 12pm on YouTube or 7.30pm on Channel 31. And remember, football fans, winter, spring, summer or fall, all you have to do is call and we'll be there because you've got a friend at Footyology. See you next week.